it's Sarah here from BJC Health coming to you from Sydney, Australia. Uh, thanks for showing an interest in one of our educational events. You're about to watch part one. Um, so enjoy the event. If you've got any questions about the content, then please consider joining BJC Connect where you can access all of our facilitators live. Um, otherwise, please consider leaving a comment and we'll do our best to get back to you. So I will need to be a bit specific on a few parts of the presentation. So once again, I do apologize if I'm too specific and it starts to be confusing. I've given Sarah my whole, my entire um, authorization to interrupt me at any moment if she feels I've been a bit confused. So I do have some objectives in mind. Um, like she said, I'm gonna give a comprehensive overview, a review of the most common blood tests in rheumatology. I'm not gonna go through all of them. Otherwise uh, I'll probably be here for at least five hours <laughs> and no one's gonna take that. Um, I'm going to focus on the blood tests, not on the diseases. So I might give some comments on a few specific diseases, but I'm not going to go into details. Once again, the focus today is on the blood tests. Um, I would like to adjust everyone's expectations by the end of the presentation um, about the limited use of the blood tests and how they are not actually as important as people think in rheumatology. And hopefully answer the most common questions that people have about these blood tests that they can be quite confusing, even for specialists sometimes. Um, so like I said, blood tests in rheumatology are often very nonspecific and does not bring us as much information as people think. Um, they are a very common cause for a referral on screening tests. So I have nothing, I go to a GP, I have a random blood test, and then it's a positive ANA, which is the first one I'll, I'll, I'll mention. And then let's send them to a rheumatologist for them to analyze it. And these results, when you go online and you Google it, you kind of find a lot of information on them and that can cause quite a bit of um, anxiety. <clears throat> they have all high rates of either false positive or false, ne false negative. And I'll explain what they are. So false positive, as the name would suggest, meaning when the blood test is positive and you don't actually have the disease. And false negative is when the blood test is negative and you actually do have the disease. And we do have high rates of both. Because of this, they all need to be really carefully analyzed. So the first one that I'll mention, which is the most common one um, for the referrals is the ANA, which is actually called antinuclear antibody. So how is an ANA performed? I think it's important. This is the only one that I'm gonna explain how it's performed because I think it's important. So the ANA is not something you put in a machine, you spin it and you get this magic result. Um, you actually, the, the pathology will get your blood, they are gonna spin it so they can separate the blood cells from the plasma, which is the liquid part of the blood and where all of your antibodies are, are, are located. So then they're gonna get your blood and they're gonna use it on another cell, a cell that is grown in the laboratory, in the pathology. Um, once they put it there, they will see how your antibodies will react to their cells. So that's going to suggest if, how many antibodies you have in your blood. And then they're going to get this blood test. And if it's positive, they're going to dilute it again. And they're going to try it again and again and again. And they'll see how intense the response is and a few other things that I'll mention here. So how is this blood test usually reported? It's positive or negative. Um, they tell us what the teeter is, and that's how intense the result is. The higher the teeter, the more likely this result is actually real. The lower the, the teeter is, the less likely this is actually related to, a, to an autoimmune disease. And a pattern. So the pathologist, and, and that's one of the most important parts today of the ANA, they're going to look in the microscope. So it's not something that the machine is going to tell us. It's a technician is going to look in the microscope and he's going to see which pattern this looks like. So human errors are very common in this blood test. So you can get different results from different laboratories. And then the pattern will represent which kind of antibodies are present in your blood cells. As you can imagine, this is quite non-specific and a lot of times will give us a lot of false results. Um, like I said, so specific patterns can be more specific for certain diseases. Just an example, homogeneous pattern will be more typical for lupus and less likely to be a false positive. On the other hand, a speckled pattern is a very common um, blood test in the, in the healthy population. So it can have much more false positives. 
if you ever see this particular one, dense fine speckled, if you have no other antibodies, that's absolutely normal. You don't need to worry. That's absolutely normal in the healthy population. And just a quick um, look on what lupus is. The symptoms are not going to go through specific diseases. So I have the link down here on the creaky joints. Um, you have a very easy overview if you want to check the specific symptoms for lupus. And this is what a technician would see. It's a kind of a pretty test and this fluorescence um, and a few different patterns here on the microscope. So why is then ANA so important? So the ANA actually has the potential to exclude lupus in almost 98% of times. So a ANA negative lupus virtually doesn't exist. I mean, virtually because it kind of does. I've, had, I've seen one patient so far, but it's incredibly rare. So if your ANA is negative, we usually look elsewhere. But like I said, a positive ANA does not confirm lupus. <clears throat> it's a very common cause of referral. So I have a positive ANA, so I have lupus. So I need to treat my lupus. Do I need medication for lupus because my ANA is positive? No, you do not. Not necessarily, I mean. Uh, ANA can be positive in multiple other diseases, either rheumatological or even non-rheumatological diseases. This is something that I'll mention on all of the blood tests. Um, blood tests can be requested for diagnosis, for prognosis, or for monitoring. So ANA does not help with the prognosis. What does that mean? Um, if the ANA is higher, it does not mean your disease is more severe. If the ANA is lower, it does not mean your disease is less severe. So it's not going to tell us how severe the disease is. It just tells us if you have it or if you don't have it. That's all. So a ANA that's 1,000 is not necessarily worse than an ANA that's 600. And it does not help with monitoring of the disease. And what does that mean? Um, if your disease gets worse, the ANA doesn't necessarily go up. And if the ANA does go up, it doesn't mean your disease is more severe. Um, the same thing on the other way around. So if the ANA drops, it doesn't mean your disease is getting better. And if your disease does get better, it doesn't mean that the ANA will drop. So it doesn't follow the disease activity. So we don't request it often. It's just once for the diagnosis and that's it. And we have a huge rate of ANA on the healthy population. So it's not a, a good screen tool. So this year was taken from the um, College of GPs on Australia, so a very trustworthy website. And as you see here, a low intensity ANA can be present in up to 40% of the healthy individuals. So Australia has about 20 million of the population. 40% would be something about 8 million. Can you imagine if 8 million people have a positive ANA and everyone gets referred to a rheumatologist? They have, what, 200 in, in all of Australia. So um, it's definitely not a good screening tool because of this amount of false positives. Even on moderate teachers, um, once again, that's how intense the test is, 5% of the healthy population have a moderate um, level ANA. It's still a very high number if you consider the overall population of Australia. This even gets higher on women and elderly. And so that's even more commonly a false positive, even on a higher teeter. And this is another very interesting number here. So if you get a random population, random meaning no symptoms, zero symptoms, you're going to get about 50 healthy people for every lupus patient. So you, you're going to have an accuracy of about 2% if you just select it randomly. So it's not a good screening test. We only, uh, in rheumatology, ask it if you have a symptom that will match an ANA. And once again, in the absence of clinical or laboratory markers supporting a diagnosis, a positive ANA is seldom useful. And it can be seen on other diseases, even on chronic infection and thyroid diseases. Now, the SDNA, that's another talk. That's a much more specific antibody. Up to 95% of patients with a DSDNA have or will have lupus at some point. Um, you still have the 5% false, false positives. So it still not doesn't mean that you do have it. And this one is a different than the NA because it does help with prognosis. If you have a DSDNA, there's more likelihood for you to have a lupus-related kidney disease. I'm just showing these things so you guys understand that different tests have different utilities. 
And this one is the only one that actually helps with monitoring. So when the DSDNA rises, your disease is likely flaring up, meaning getting worse. And if this drops, your disease is likely improving. So this is one that we will request it on pretty much every single appointment from lupus, and, and that's why. I'm not going to go on single every single one of these. So when we request ENA, uh, Sarah, as you can see the Sarah's um, desperation look. <laughs> um, when we request this test here called ENA, that's extractable um, antibodies, um, the ANA is a panel of different antibodies, not, not just one. So we have here one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different antibodies, and each one of them are going to have a different significance. If you guys want to take a picture or want to log into the recording afterwards and see a very summarized reason for each one of them, feel free to jump in. So rheumatoid factor is another one of the extremely common causes of referral because it's so often requested. And contrary to common belief, it is not a specific test to rheumatoid arthritis. There are multiple other diseases that can have a positive rheumatoid factor. It can be positive up to 4% of the young and healthy individuals. That's also a very high number. And uh, in the elderly population, it's even more often. So for example, just for rheumatic diseases, it can be positive in Sjogren's syndrome, mixed connective tissue disease, cryoglobulinemia, lupus, inflammatory myositis. Obviously, I'm not going to go into details of each disease, but just showing how many disease this test can actually be positive. And it can be positive in non-rheumatic disease, like other autoimmune diseases. Even thyroid diseases are usually autoimmune. Um, chronic infections such as viral hepatitis, tuberculosis, even influenza can cause a positive rheumatoid factor. And the a test that if you have it, it diagnoses rheumatoid arthritis. You need to match it with specific symptoms for rheumatoid arthritis. So here, once again, number of other diseases and conditions can raise the, 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 rheumatoid, the, the rheumatoid factor level, including cancer, chronic infections, sarcoidosis, sugar syndrome, lupus, and some healthy individuals, usually older individuals, have a positive rheumatoid factor, and we don't know why. It's what we call, once again, a false positive. And how do we analyze the, the, the rheumatoid factor? Um, they can help us diagnose rheumatoid arthritis, but that depends on the symptoms. It's not just a positive test. If you have specific symptoms for rheumatoid arthritis, have specific joint pains, the a positive rheumatoid arthritis, then it will tell us a lot. Plus, higher levels of rheumatoid factor will likely to cause a poorer prognosis, a disease that's a bit more aggressive. So we tend to be also more aggressive on the treatment. And this is the kind of abnormalities we want to prevent. It's a late stage of rheumatoid arthritis. This kind of manifestation is more common if the rheumatoid factor, or the next one that I'll mention, the, the NTCCP, if they are positive. Um, similar to the ANA, this one does not improve once the disease is treated. And it does not lower, um, the NOS, does not go up when the disease is flaring up. So we do not repeat it on a regular basis. It's just for diagnosis. And I don't know, if we're thinking maybe your disease has changed and become something else, and we, we want to reinvestigate and we request it again, but not on a regular basis. And the negative blood test, unfortunately, it doesn't exclude it either. So approximately 20% have what we call seronegative rheumatoid arthritis, in rheumatoid arthritis with none of the antibodies. And the NTCCP, which is the other one for the rheumatoid factor, it is much more specific. So about 95% of patients with an NTCCP has or will have rheumatoid arthritis at some point. Once again, there's still the 5% of false positives. So it does not confirm the disease. And similarly to the rheumatoid factor, it requires matching symptoms to confirm a diagnosis. It helps with both diagnosis and prognosis. So same as I said about the rheumatoid factor, the higher NTCCP usually means the disease is more aggressive, more likely to cause damage. And the NTCCP will not reduce when the disease is treated and will not increase during flare-up. So we do not request it on a regular basis. And once again, a negative NTCCP does not exclude rheumatoid arthritis because of the 
um, seronegative rheumatoid arthritis. Um, <clears throat> HLA-B27 is another very interesting one. This is actually a genetic marker. It's the only genetic marker that we have in rheumatology. This one is either positive or negative. There's no high levels, low levels. And once positive, it's always positive. So if you had a positive result 20 years ago, that's fine by me. I don't need to repeat it. Um, and since it's a genetic test and we don't have genetic therapy yet, it's not going to normalize once the disease is treated. So we don't request it again. And it does have a very strong family association because it's a gene test. So if you have someone in your family with a positive HLA-B27, you have a much higher chance of having the positive HLA-B27 yourself. Why is the HLA-B27 um, important? Because 90% of patients with a disease called ankylosing spondylitis will have a positive HLA-B27. Once again, there's still a 10% that are negative. Can be positive in other diseases like psoriatic arthritis, reactive arthritis, even uveitis. But the tricky thing here is that can be positive in almost 10% of the healthy population, while only 2% will have enclosing spondylitis. So once again, using the example of Australia, if you tested in on the whole Australian population, about um, 2 million are going to have the positive test, and much less than that will actually have the disease. Just to show you, once again, from the College of Physicians, I've highlighted the important part of it. Everything starts in the top with a symptom. So it doesn't start in the top with a screening of a HLA-B27. First, you need chronic back pain for, the, for this disease. And then if you have the chronic back pain, then you go for the HLA-B27, not the other way around. So once again, not a screening test. Um, C-reactive protein, um, once again, sorry if I'm being a bit too intense, I like point in the beginning. C-reactive protein, that's a much more commonly used one, not just for rheumatologists. C-reactive protein is actually protein produced by the liver and has a utility to fight infections. Um, so it has active functions on the immune response and inflammation. So that's for not just immune diseases, that's for infections, that's for everything that causes inflammation can cause a high CRP. And this is used in rheumatology as a marker of inflammation. So this is the one we use to monitor disease activity. And this is pretty much any disease. If we're talking about rheumatoid arthritis, ankylosing spondylitis, lupus, Sjogren syndrome, any of our diseases, we use CRP as a, as a part of the disease monitoring. But it's very non-specific. It can be raising any inflammation. It can be raising inflammation. And sometimes it's raising, we don't know why. So I saw a patient today, she has osteoarthritis, which is wear and tear. It's not a disease that's supposed to cause um, a high CRP. She still has it. And, and we don't know why. She's had it for, I don't know, 10 years. And it's never been matched with symptoms. So sometimes we can't really explain why someone would have a, a, a raised CRP. And it can also be negative in rheumatic diseases. So while this is a much better screening tool, because if you have something causing a high CRP, we do need to investigate. The negative one doesn't exclude it. So it can still have a rheumatoid arthritis with a negative rheumatoid, uh, sorry, CRP, for example. And ESR is the other marker of inflammation that we use a lot in rheumatology. And it's a very interesting test because it's such, such an easy test to do. So basically, they collect your blood test, the, their, your bloods, they put it in a test tube that has a, a lot of millimeters on it. And they leave it there for about an hour. <laughs> That's it. That's all the test is. It's not spinned. It's not run through expensive machines. That's all. We can do it at home if you want to. Just grab the tube, put the blood in and leave it there for an hour. And why does it help? Because the blood cells are heavier than what I've explained before, the plasma. The plasma, which is just the liquid, is lighter. So the blood cells will drop. So why does it make a difference and why does it, does, does it become higher on inflammation? Because inflammation means you have a lot of proteins in the blood and the proteins are heavier. So it's going to make your cells drop faster. So then you measure the amount of plasma remaining. The, the, the more plasma means the more cells dropped. So meaning usually more inflammation. But as you can imagine, this is very nonspecific because there's too many things that can cause the cells to drop faster. So this is just an image of the ESR with all of the, the millimeters. It can be on the on where you put the blood the test tubes in, or it can be in the test tubes. Um, 
And what, like I said, it can be affected for a number of reasons. So things that can make your ESR higher is age, female sex, pregnancy, a lot of different things can cause it. And anticoagulants, small blood cells, what we call microcytosis, or your, if your cells are smaller than the average individual, it's going to drop smaller, uh, slower. So then there's a lot of different reasons why an ESR would be higher or lower without actually meaning inflammation. Because this test has so many different things that can affect it, we often don't look at the result from the pathology. So even if it says, I don't know, 10, the normal result of an ESR, we calculate. So let's say someone here is 50 years old, female patient. On female, is going to be 50 plus 10. So that's 60 divided by 2, 30. So even though the pathology is going to say the normal is 10, we're going to use 30. And men, you just don't use the plus 10. So men, a 50-year-old male, would be 50 divided by 2. So that's 25, regardless of what the pathology tells you that's the right result. And it's usually a slower test to go up or down comparing to the CRP. So this is a graph. Uh, there's other things here as well, but try to focus on the bright red and the, I don't know, is that brown or purple? Um, let's say you have a flu, uh, an acute infection. So the CRP, which is a bright red, will spike really quickly in a matter of days and maybe a week. It's going to go up on the maximum. And then when it's the infection is gone, then it's going to drop really quickly. And the ESR is much of a slower so it takes a long time to go up and then a long time to go down. So if you have a blood test where your ESR is super raised and your CRP isn't, that might be the cause of it. And the opposite is the same. So if your CRP is super high and ESR isn't, that might be the cause of it as well. Um, NCAM, I'll go through it very quickly. So that's a test that's very similar to the ANA, but it's usually more um, associated to vasculitis. So that's inflammation of the blood vessels. It can be positive in other diseases like ulcerative colitis, which is a bowel disease. And we have some others here. So uh, since they are less common, um, uric acid is quite common, but at least less complex, I, I've summarized them all here. So urate or uric acid is, uh, is used for diagnosis and monitoring of a disease called gout. The tricky thing is, and this is a very common cause of referral, you can actually drop during a flare-up. So your body realizes approximately what's going on. So it starts to pee out your urate. So when you collect the blood test of the, of the gout during flare-up is normal. Once you repeat it afterwards, it goes up. So I've had a patient, for example, that his urate, and it doesn't matter the reference range, what's, what we consider positive or not, you'll see the big difference. Um, this patient, the urate was 0 0.31 or 0 0.32, which is normal. Um, so he had typical symptoms of gout with a normal urate. So he was sent to us for investigation. All I did was just, you know what, wait a month and repeat it. And that's all. His urate from, went from 0 0.31 to 0 0.74. So more than doubled. That's because it can be low during flare-up. We have these other specific antibodies here called anticardiolipin antibodies and anti-beta-2 glycoproteins. They are very weird names, so don't blame me. I'm not the one that made these names. They are for a disease called antiphospholipid syndrome that causes clots and miscarriages. And same as the urate, it can be negative during a flare-up because once again, the antibodies are going to go in the clot. So if you have a, a disease that's causing frequent clots, you do need to check it between clots, not on the, on the episode itself. And that's another funny one. Lupus anticoagulant, which is not a, this is not a test for lupus and is not anticoagulant. Once again, don't blame me, blame the guy that created this name. <laughs> so why did he have this very weird name? Um, because the first patient they figured this one out is a patient with lupus. And if you put in a test tube, it becomes an anticoagulant. So what is an anticoagulant? It's a blood thinner. But in your body, it does the opposite. It's actually creating clots. And that's for the same disease that I mentioned before, the antiphospholipid syndrome. So if you have this positive test here and you're taking aspirin and you're taking any blood thinners, you can ignore it because that's not an antibody. That's a functional test. So if your blood is being thinned by a medication, the test is going to be positive because it, 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 that's all that's testing. Okay. So you've just finished watching part one of one of our recent educational events. Hope you enjoyed the content. 
If you'd like to access part two, then you need to sign up for BJC Connect. It's a free platform where you can access not just the recordings of uh, past events, but also access a whole range of upcoming future events and access our team of facilitators live. Um, all of the details that you need to join BJC Connect are now flashing up on your screen. But otherwise, like our staff, subscribe if you'd like to see more information from BJC Health. Look forward to seeing you.